Welcome everyone to the second annual Vintage Computer Festival Midwest edition. Fortunately, after the turnout last year, I decided to have one this year, and so far it looks like we're doing okay. Might even have a third one next year, who knows. Our first speaker that we're having is George Goebel and Mike Marsh. George and Mike have worked at Purdue doing IT support. George since 1975 and Mike since the late 60s, I believe. Um, they're most noted for working their work on the dual processor VAX project in ECN, where they combined two VAX 11 780s into a single dual processor machine. George, would you like to start? Yeah, I guess most people know me by, by GHG. I'm standing wave here, set up here. I'll stand over on this side so I don't induce a feedback loop. But, uh, I don't know, it was back in the uh, in early 80s, like 81, and, and back then, you know, you buy a full-blown vacuum deck, it was uh, half a million bucks or something like that, you know, for a screaming one-bit machine. And then that was considered, a, you know, a good deal compared to the PDP-11s uh, came before it, and, and which had very limited address space. They, they just basically had 16-bit address spaces. And we were trying to cram the kernel in to get things to fit. And, uh, and, and meanwhile, Unix developed at Bell Labs could only comfortably run, you know, 10, 15 users max without getting into problem. And we pushed a PDP 11, 1170 up into the, I don't know, 120, 130 user level. But uh, and then the VAX 780 finally came out. And uh, VAX, VAX stands for Virtual Address Extension. And, and so, uh, being a 32-bit machine, it took all the restrictions off off the address. But uh, at the time, I, I was almost in daily contact with Bill Joy at Berkeley, who she probably know is one of the founders of Sun. And he was working on 3BSD and you know and 4BSD Unix at the time, which was a Berkeley software distribution version of the Bell Unix. And so. Uh, we did a lot of testing and you know speed ups, and we were always pushing it to the limit. And they had a development machine out there called UC Bvax. If you remember the UUCP days, that was also a big mail hub. And and I had an account on on that machine as well for picking up stuff. And and, and they had a machine called Monet where they did most of their development. But kind of a side note here: uh, when they were shipping Berkeley software di distributions, I guess. Joe told me uh, Sony actually came out with a news workstation, and they uh, picked, a, you know, made, made the official Berkeley software distribution, you know, four point something BSD, four point two or three. I don't know what it was, Joe. And they left a GHG account on, uh, you know, because I just happened to be one of the users, and and so Sony didn't know I was a user, and they, they thought I was like a demon or you know, <laughs> LP or something, and they, so they left, and I, and I got the same UID as I do at Purdue, and it. And it got distributed, I don't know how many tens of thousands of machines, every one they sold had the GHG account on it. <laughs> so uh, now I think these days vendors do a little bit more security when they uh, put out a software re release. But, you know, that was the 80s and early 90s or something on that. But that's beside the point. But uh, Yeah, it was funny to get that out of the box and George already had a login. <laughs> 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 Oh, uh, we had, I, I'm from the CAD lab, computer engineering graphics lab at the time, and we had a, a visitor from Sony, so uh, Sony was uh, looking at uh, applications for this uh, computer and stuff, so uh, they sent us one for Okay, but then we, uh, I, I guess back in the days of the PDP-11s and at least early VAXs, you got the schematic diagrams you could get with the system called the prints. And, and so at the time, uh, we actually, you know, could do board level repairs and, and fix stuff down to failing chips most of the time. I mean, today you just throw the whole computer away when something breaks. But back then, you know, when you're talking about a half million dollar machine, it, it's worthwhile to, to track this stuff down. And so, uh, and this was back in the summer, 
uh, of 80, 81, and I think uh, right before the 4th of July, and, and, and Mike was going through the prints of the 780 and noticed some comment in there on the SBI, the Synchronous Backplane Interconnect, which is the main system bus, and, and there were some jumpers uh, It said, put these in here for termination or extra CPUs. And, and, and it turned out there, there, there was errors in the prints, as, as Mike can tell you in a little bit here, but that, that was the only mention. There's this little subtle footnote on the prints about extra CPU. And it turned out that DEC went down a path. They came out with a dual 780 as well, called a 782, but, but they did it so it cost a million dollars. They, they, they made multiple shared memory controllers and, and basically took two systems and, and added, I don't know, it was tens of thousands of dollars for a four megabyte dual ported memory controller with, with four megabytes of RAM on it called the MA780. And so what they would do is basically take two full blown real 780s and then connect them with these MA780s, very expensive shared memory controllers. And turns out our dual CPU uh, Unix actually ran on that thing. I, I went and did consulting for Armando Stetner out at DEC and they brought up the Purdue EE kernel on that and then it ran. But, uh, but so they had one too, but it cost like four or five times the cost of the way that we ended up doing it. And so uh, basically the 4th of July weekend uh, in 81, uh, we had the EC machine, or it used to be called VE in the beginning. That's the, with all the double E uh, undergrads run the Munchkins, if you're in EE 263, you're known as a Munchkin and your home directory was in EC slash B. But uh, so we got that weekend to take it down and then we ordered a, uh, we had the ED machine that arrived, but it wasn't set up yet. So we actually got permission to uh, take EC down and, and the ED slave, or the CPU, to see if we could make a dual VAX work. And I guess I'll, Mike can come up here and, you know, kind of tell you, you know, his, you know, he actually built the hardware and then uh, for the thing, I, I hung around, but you might want to say it in your own words at this point when, when we took over and started that. <laughs> Sundown states and all that stuff, you know. Now, one thing I remember about it was um, we got the box in. The, the way we did this was I put together a, uh, an order for a spare parts kit for VAX, and it was, I think, missing two boards to be a complete CPU, so we just bought those extra, and it ended up costing $50,000. And as I recall, uh, a full blown VAX was about 250 grand. And the box came in from deck where I ordered spare parts, of course, all the time, and this big thing comes in. You open it up, and there was a sticker there that said, buy one, get one free <laughs> inside the box. So they knew what we were doing. Um, but let's see, what did we do of interest there? Oh, the other neat thing I found in the uh, nine-week course, I guess it was, that was the internals course for the VAX, in which they went through every gate, every piece of microcode, you knew everything about that machine back then when you take a course on it. And uh, we noticed the Unibus was uh, also had an interesting departure from their normal termination. It was a separate card, and you could, if you wanted to, stick a CPU out there, and it would to do the bus arbitration and whatever else of interest. Um, so part of the dual VAX project was the first thing we did was built a uh, DD60 style monitor, if you know CDC history. We uh, stuck a CPU out there, 1144, out on the Unibus on the VAX. And uh, George built a stripped down kernel that uh, had a bunch of different formats for PS. And the interesting feature was that if you generated the right address on the Unibus out on the terminator side of the the Unibus adapter, the window between the, the VAX SBI and the outside world, you could page yourself around in, in VAX internal memory. So you could peek at the VAX memory even if it was dead in the water. Various machines had different styles of operating DMA, and the 1144 was, was able to, um, and the VAX 
memory was able to operate DMAs when the processor was stopped. It wasn't true of all the machines. 1140 couldn't do it. I, 1145 couldn't. So anyway, we had this, this interesting device which could peek around in the memory, which made debugging the dual processor kernel a lot easier, well, possible. Um, and I guess we did that as a, a show at SIGGRAPH once down in Austin. Yeah, show this, this thing running. Whatever, took a, shot a movie of it and played it. You know, yeah. so you could, it looked like, the, I guess, the O display on, on the CDC on, on Purdue Mace, you know, where you can see the all the jobs show up or, or whatever. All show the interrupt stuff. table, see who's stepping on whose interrupt vector, all that good stuff. But this was one of the first times you could actually see like a, a PS running real time, you know, updated 10 times a second. You know, they have stuff for PC now like Proc EXP and, and things are fast enough. But, I mean, this was 19, you know, 1980, so. Yeah, Pete Hollenbeck, one of our techs, built a uh, basically 500 kilobaud terminal to display this stuff. And uh, I guess the other interesting feature of it was it had a paid eight and a half by 11 aspect ratio on the monitor. So it was the monitor tipped sideways, which some people had discovered to be useful at that time. Um, you know, there's no such thing as a graphic card back then. Everything was, was serial, you know, ports and down terminals in that era. Yeah. So. Except this one was connected through the Unibus with a DR11B parallel DMA device. Yeah. So it ran at a pretty good clip. Uh, some other interesting an anecdotes we went through there. The uh, DMC11 synchronous link yeah. was DMC a... DMR11. Uh, DMR was a parallel and the DMC was the, the serial. It had a separate line card, which we had uh, doing Bill Croft's um, first, yeah, what do you call it? Which was similar to the NCP protocol for the first ARPANET. First local area network. The fastest thing we could find was this DMC-11, which ran at a, a megabit over a coax link. And uh, so it happens that AT&T used these all over the country for backing up their, their redundant uh, uh, switch computers. They used PDP-11, 1170s or whatever. And we got these things, and they wouldn't really work reliably on the VAC, so... Our operating mode was, well, T-shirt, Tektronics, logic analyzers are what you need. George could work up some code that would make something break reliably, and if he could do that, then we could fix it. Um, so he really uh, beat on this DR11B, and we got it so it would fail within minutes. <laughs> Hooked up the logic analyzers and found a problem with it. and. Um, it was a race condition in there. Well, the, the classical flip-flop uh, bistable problem, which they'd screwed up in the Unibus interface. And uh, there was a second problem too, I can't quite recall the details, but it had to do with a timing, an RC timing network that they stuck in there for, for booting, a timeout on boot or something. But uh, once we fixed that, we could run the, uh, the DMC-11 link full blast at a megabit uh, on the backs. And sometime later, I was uh, in a course at DEC and happened to mention this to one of the AT&T guys. And he said, oh, gee, I wonder if that's a problem with our machines. We can't keep the thing synchronized. They, they, the link dies about every three or four hours, and we have to restart the whole backup process over again. So, so it was a little useful in that respect. And uh, Years later on this thread, I, I went to work over at the computing center where they had a bunch of these things running on RISTAs for various weird protocols. They had the, the DR11B was, a, or the DMC11 was a, a bit slice microprocessor, really nasty thing. And uh, we were having some problems running some, some protocol link on it. So we put out a call to DEC to see if they knew anybody that had a handle on how this worked because often typically the design engineer would leave the company, you know, he'd do his project, he'd leave the company, nobody really knew how it worked anymore and that was the case with this. So Deck was, wanted, me, wanted to be helpful to us so they 
thrashed around the net and asked their contacts, you know, who's the expert on the, the MC-11B? And so they finally got us an answer back, somebody we could contact, and it was Mike Marsh, this guy at <laughs> Purdue who worked on this years ago. So, well, thanks a lot, that's a real help, guys. <laughs> but, um, Oh, what other goodies did we find in the dual vax stuff? Well, the prober instruction, that whole mess with the oh, yeah. three bytes of a page boundary, we had to drop in no ups all through low four because if you were doing a check, uh, checking previous instruction space, which is checking user space for permissions, and the prober instruction was prefetching ahead of it, like if it was with an eight, eight bytes of an end of a page boundary, then you flipped over to do a user mode access check, and if that access check you know, failed, then, then the prefetch went on in kernel mode, and the, the hardware was set in the user mode to do an access test of the buffer, and the prefetch would abort and cause the kernel trap. And, and it turns out this this uh, running in dual CPU mode, we, well, actually, we, we, we've been watching the memory controller, and we noticed the memory was only 30% busy before we did this thing. They were wasting two-thirds of the memory bandwidth just running one processor, so we figured you could add a second CPU on the memory controller and run it about 80, 90 percent busy, and, and which it turned out to be true. But it, it changed the timing on this prober instruction a little bit, so that it, it would die almost immediately, I mean, 15, 20 seconds. And, and, and then the fix was to stick, if we could detect that the prober instruction was when eight bytes would end of a page, and then we just stuck no ops in there, so, you know, not give you any bytes of the page and I fixed it. And DEC never did fix that. Because and it actually it even happened on single CPU systems in a rare amount. And it even happened on VMS and caused VMS to trap. And but they still refused to fix it. Well the fix as it turns out would have been about doubling the size of the microcode because you had to duplicate this whole thread of uh, checking the you would have had to duplicate it for the other user space or something, as it turns out. Yeah. So there was no way they could do it. So, so they, they never did fix that part. Yeah. That was probably the hardest, nastiest one. Every time we do a new recompile of the kernel, we have to go through and, and search all the program. I think there was like 18 program instructions in, in low 4.s or whatever for, for various things. But fortunately, it wasn't. It was isolated to low core and it wasn't gen the instruction C compiler would generate stick anywhere it wanted to. So but after that it, it ran pretty well and we would get if you're we only ran uh, master slave mode and so you know if you're running user mode processes we would get almost two X performance. But obviously if you were all doing total syscalls you'd only get one X performance. Overall, I think we got you know 1.8, 1.9 for the mix of jobs. So, but I think it was the world's first multi-processor Unix kernel. So uh, that's kind of where it started. So we got it working in about two weeks. Uh, originally, we just wrote a spin loop in there in, in Load.js that would prove the hardware would run and, and the bus would come apart. And about yeah, yeah. six months to get all the instances of the prober instruction out and yeah, other little Yeah, we got glitches. the thing up and switched to production in two weeks and had a, you know, crash every couple of days for, you know, and then they got farther and farther apart as we ran into prober instructions months later. Took them out, moved them around. But it was worth it. I think we ended up building like 18 machines in ECN and saved us, I don't know, four or five million bucks over Buying what, buying spares kit, didn't we? I think uh, eventually we had maybe 35 of them at Purdue. We built a bunch at the Computing Center, too. Yeah, and then and, and DEC built a bunch, too, on, you know, pine the materials for several customers as well. And uh, BRL, um, oh, who was it? Argon built one or Batavia? I can't remember. There were a bunch around the country. But, but the know, one that irked me the most was this was the second Star Wars movie they were coming out with and uh, Lucasfilm crew called us and they wanted to build one of these and wanted us to come out and build it for them. George says, oh no, we can do it over the phone and just give you this paper and help you and be fine, you know, which they did. 
And they got it to work, and then they said, uh, gee, we want to do something for you for this. So they offered us tickets to the opening. Well, I didn't hear about this because they, until after George had told them on the phone that, oh, no, you don't need to bother with that. And I heard about it later and could have strangled him. Oh, I don't remember that. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, oh, doing the, uh, the bus bandwidth test. I remember that uh, coming up with a couple Nixie tube counters and some weird configuration to, to monitor the SBI and figure out what the percentage of bus busy, et cetera, was. That was amusing. So I borrowed some old equipment I had from physics. Um, so I used to work in, in uh, spectroscopy over there, and we had counters and all kinds of interesting lab equipment that normally you don't hang on a computer, but it uh, turned out to be useful. I don't know. What oddities can we talk about other than that? It's, I've got a URL to my web page. It's in the archive.org. Uh, it's got the report on it if anybody wants to download that. Get the URL. Maybe I'll take, we'll take it back over to the other room here when the talk's over and you know, somebody can pull it down and you know, get the copy for you if you want to put the URL down. It's after the, my home page is up for nine years and the DM Engineering Office banned it. <laughs> after uh, for the and grill, charcoal grill, you probably know about that. Because the common rumor is that Father Land Security called up somebody in the Dean's office and complained about use of explosives and, uh, and after 9 11, you know, it was too sensitive. But it had been up for nine years before, and I don't see how. Well, I, I guess you can see because if you pre soak the briquettes with liquid nitrogen, it's equal to about two sticks of dynamite. It was pre soaked, and they used to use that for pouring plastic before they came up with ANFO. So, uh, but, <laughs> So, so, plus the fire department, you know, told me never to do it again. Uh, they turned me to the ATF for uh, for uh, use of explosives, and this was before 9-11. And, uh, and the street department got tired of filling the holes where the uh, tar was melted in the road. <laughs> but, so. I remember, first thing I remember coming to, uh, the ECN was, um, they had this old machine called Patrick's machine, which oh, that's 1140. it's 1145, I think. Oh, 1145 yeah, which strangely enough, one of my former college roommates had worked on, um, but it crashed regularly, probably because they had so much stuff hanging on it. Yeah, well, that was a, a good challenge to figure out why this thing wouldn't run. And I got to looking at various papers from MIT, and MIT had PDP-11 systems running with 100-foot unibuses that would run down to another floor and everything. <laughs> and, uh, but I looked at what they'd done, and they hadn't done much except very carefully and custom terminating the bus at each end. They didn't have a whole lot of equipment on, the, on their bus. It was just long. Yeah, and next solution was to put repeaters every so often to regenerate the signals, and of course would slow the thing down horribly, and introduce a lot more hardware to break. So we got to looking at this, and I dragged out all the the equipment again, the logic analyzers and scopes and counters and low low ohm digital voltmeters, and well, they weren't digital then, come to think of it. But it um, turns out DEC had basically ignored transmission line theory when they designed the Unibus. And they had these long stubs. They had uh, the card cage was about yay big, and they'd come in the top of the thing with the Unibus and then repeat it and go on out. I, I just string the, the wires together across the slots and go on out to the next one. And then there were these long lines coming down the back plane to each critical signal, the asynchronous. Uh, signals, master sync, slave sync, I can't remember them all anymore, but but the upshot of, of this was you generate a reflection at every backplane device. And as time went on down the bus, these reflections would would uh, 
move around in time and space, and if they added up at the right spot where there happened to be a gate, and they exceeded the threshold, the TTL threshold, you tripped the gate there, and he just thought he was supposed to do something, and he really didn't. And the bus, and the bus would hang, and we had, we came up with a little bus meter, just an analog meter that uh, looked at bus busy and a couple other important signals. Um, and when the bus hung, the needle just flopped over to the edge and sat there, so you knew you had a problem. And one thing we did was, at, at that point, of course, it's an open collector bus, so everybody has the ability to drive the thing. So you don't know who's responsible. So you take your meter and you go down to each back plane with your hundred, hundredth of an ohm meter and look at the uh, signal level and see where it's closest to ground. And that's the guy that's driving it. So that's a little more clue that we had. But and you um, go through rewiring of those keys and uh, loop down and back up. Right. So the solution was instead of coming across the top of the thing and going right out again with your bus and everything's a long stub off from it, you come in to the first slot, you go down, across, and up and out again, and well, shorten the a uh, whole bunch better. Shorten the stubs, and it got a whole lot better. And we actually gave a talk. Did you go down to the Austin, uh, Texas Usenics and we gave a talk on tuning unibuses and stuff? Yeah, I guess. Is it the same one we showed the movie of the 1144 with all the interactive? Plays on that too, mm -hmm. and it just everybody just dropped their jaws on you know deck was there on how to tune the best hardware to make it work under maximum load. And they incorporated the changes into their you know FCO, so eventually it, it got better. But the other thing you had to be careful of was now you could string multiple cabinets together. Well, the ground creep would kill you eventually too, so we had to string big ground braids to each unibus cabinet to keep that ground reference down or it would creep up and go over the threshold so and watch the details and the other thing nobody seemed to remember was from year to year that you got to worry about 7474 flip flops and the asynchronous device stable glitch problem and invariably somebody would come out with a new design of something and it would hang the bus because they forgot about that little detail again probably re repeats every 10 years as they get a new crop of engineers or something. And we had one that was another interesting little anecdote, the, uh, the IBIS disk drives, you remember those? First high performance parallel transfer disk drive that uh, they designed for Craze. Um, and we had one on the Cyber 205 uh, back in 82, I think we got that, Cyber 205 over at you remember that, Joe, I guess. Oh, yeah. Well, I can't remember the date. Yeah. Paul Fuller back then. Well, our director's designed uh, bus controller, or disc controllers for the things. So he'd done one for the Cyber 205, and it was, it was pretty successful. The uh, increase in performance on the 205 system as a whole, I think, went up about 30% just by putting a, a higher performance disc on the system. But these were monster things. They were yay tall and weighed a thousand pounds and had probably 15 boards in them with 6,800 controllers and yeah, four channels. You had a on every head, you know, transfer every head in parallel. Right. Just like today, you get these rate controllers that when you do 800 meg a second by you know, just put 16 drives in there, and rate five, and you can suck them all out to an inkjet express bus. But there was a little glitch in the thing, and I don't know how we found it, but uh, John Jackson had this program called MST, which would write data to the drive, random data, known random data, and check it, not rely on the ECC. And somehow we managed to get some data patterns that didn't work, and tracking them down, they were of an odd nature. It was like the probe instruction happened at the end of a, a buffer, on the last byte of the last nibble of the last long word of one of these buffers. And it had to be a certain data pattern, and it would always pick the bit. And uh, we tracked this down and got, got a hold of IBIS, and they said, oh, yeah, we, uh, we noticed that with the Cray runs and thought we had fixed it. Um, 
But they hadn't. <laughs> Not only that, they duplicated the problem when they took this model and VLSI'd all these boards onto a single board with now these eight or ten big chips. And they duplicated their problem in this series of drives too, which we proved to them. So the only way we could get a working drive was to hand select them because some of them would work and some would not. You, some of them did not have the bug. It was, it was a real close timing thing. And uh, we'd run our program and say, yep, this one is good, we'll pay for it. And this one's not, take it back. <laughs> Well, as far as burning in machines back uh, in the PDP-11 days, it took up to a year to uh, sign off on a machine from deck and to get it stable before we could run production on it. And uh, we're running hours, this is like the PDP-11-70 delivered, and it took ours. Uh, turns out that every now and then they send a factory team out from Maynard to do an install, so it went well. And I think we were supposed to have gotten that team, but somehow got reversed and Puck got it for their PP11 for their Aristus machine. So it came up okay, and we got the screwdriver Steve from Indianapolis to install ours, and Meyer and Cassidy. And uh, so, uh, and I ours drug on for a year, and then and I point out all these things that didn't work, and the, the RP04 disk drive, I mean, it was a 88 megabyte drive for the whole department kind of wash machine pack in it, you know, and put, put in clear glass top and you could actually see the beading pattern on top of the fluorescent light strobe effect on the label because it, it was spinning at 3600 RPM. And so when the motor speed would vary, you could see the strobe pattern move as it started to go out and we knew when it was going to fault and go unsafe and so I'd see that pattern start moving and we'd go across the hall and tell all the users to save their files. And, because the drive is going to go and say you crashed. <laughs> and, uh, and I know I know that Steve Brandt was working on it from deck and cycled a couple times and the motor thermal down, it wouldn't start. And, and he was out there. You know, these, these disk drives are like three phase 208, you know, 30 amps to spin them up. I mean, you know, two, three horsepower motors in them. I mean, serious stuff. And uh, so he's sitting there, it wouldn't start. He's sitting there with a screwdriver pushing contacts around inside the drive. And all at once there's this huge, you know, big fireball comes out of the bottom of the drive. And, and I took one, one leap across 338 and hit the red button on the way out, you know, and, and he just burnt the hell out of it. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, breakers don't trip immediately when you short them out on a, you know, 30 amp circuit, you know, so you get three or 400 amps for you know, a couple seconds, and, and he burnt the thing up. So they end up giving us a new RPO for and then Myron Cassidy smoked our TU-16 tape drive to him, something similar, and mm -hmm. it was just one dumbass attack after another from Dick Indianapolis. And, and, then, <laughs> and eventually they had to call the Maynard factory team in to clean the whole mess up that Indianapolis made, and, and then our deck salesman at the time was Don Schmelzel, and, uh, the definition of a Schmelzel filter was 32 levels of double talk between Indianapolis and <laughs> Well, I was out in Maynard one time, and they weren't a whole lot better. It was a TU-16 course, and, and um, of course, you got to strip down the machine, take everything off, and rebuild it, basically. And we're working on ours, and all of a sudden, there's this huge kabang over in the corner of the room, and smoke starts pouring out of something. And fire alarms go off. And, well, one of the classes, they'd um, had their TU-16, they were putting it back together, and they had these big filter capacitors in the power supplies. They put them in backwards and <laughs> parted on, <laughs> and it was quite amusing. Oh, we had a lot of good disk drive oddities. There was uh, the company System Industries, SI. Oh. Now, that was a fiasco. But they had... Uh, they almost a new controller. For a, while, a 9800 controller. And yeah. They, they used to have a 9500 controller that was all built on a discrete TTL. We had that on Foo's machine, and that ran a CDC 9766, a 300 megabyte drive, which just seemed like infinite disk space compared to the 80 megabyte drives. And it was cheaper, too. And, and I think this was the same, what it was, 844, Joe, that was uh, the CDC version of that drive. 
Yeah, of course, we had to fix our bus interface first. Yeah, this uh, went on and on. And, and finally, the Emulex came by and got their stuff going. And we had this massive trade in work. We had some picture of the EE loading dock with this PIO SI disk controllers, you know, floor to ceiling that the Emulex bought out to replace, you know, all these you know, Emulex controllers for, I don't know, several thousand, tens of thousands of bucks. But they were. Then rock solid. I mean, but, but system industry was first and had it working. I mean, like just came by later. You see, and there was just a single board controller that, that was rock solid, plugged right in the slot. And yeah, SBI. Yeah. Full board SBI. Well, one of the little glitches along the way with system industry was they thought uh, they'd do a better job of the ECC, so they came out with a, a 56 bit ECC code instead of a 32 bit. I don't know if it's the American theory that more is better or what, but um, uh, over in the ARPA lab where they're doing pattern recognition, they had a problem one day, and uh, we thought we had a, a disk problem. So we uh, moved his, his application over to one of the other machines, 1170 in, in the other building, had the same problem. Turns out he had come up with a it was a, a graphic image, a um, nice random bit pattern, I suppose, but it broke the 56-bit ECC. Wherever we put that file on an SI controller, it would break. And I, hard, I forget hard the, line, you know, hard VR on it, right? Certain data pattern, you know, the, the media was good, it just broke the controller. Yeah, they, they chose a bad polynomial. <laughs> um, oh, what other goodies did we have? I, yeah. yeah, I can't remember how they fixed that or if they did fix it. Yeah, now you can just go to China Mart and buy a three hundred dollar Dell or Dell PC, take it out of the box and plug it in and have it work, you know, turn it on and it runs for days without crashing. I mean you don't know how how many years it took to get that stable. I mean it, it was pretty well accepted that it took a year to get, you know, these half million dollar you know, tenth of a mint machines, half a mint machines stable for users back in the 75 to 80 time frame. So, all these things we take for granted today had uh, I mean, a lot of hard blood and sweat went into it to get them that way. But at least you had source code. Yeah, and had prints and stuff. But, uh, I know on, on disks they used to have this, uh, Fujitsu had this 160 megabyte pre-Eagle drive before the infamous 474 megabyte Eagle in the early Winchester drive and had a clear plastic top on it. This is like a full rack mount drive you know, this long. And we had, I don't know, 10 or 15 of them. And I remember over at Civil, we started getting a lot of head crashes and, and on, the, on the Monday mornings. And, uh, and you could look at them and start to see the silver rings forming on them. And, and we could read the data for a while on the silver ring. And, uh, because it was just thin enough, there was enough signal there where it could still read it. But it turns out that, that we, and there are other hospitals that were losing hundreds of them, but they didn't know why. And we found out because the Unix sinks the super block and the heads go over and set, you know, cylinder zero, or, or you know, the partition, the, which would have been the root drive, you know, cylinder zero, and, and so it would always leave it parked on cylinder zero, and then the, the lubricant would overheat after the drive sat there for hours. And then if you did, so my old would look up like a couple I notes and it would move it like two, two cylinders. And so now the head is over the edge of the trough. You know, you've got a trough that may be competing and then you've got an edge on each side. And you move it two or three cylinders, now the head is digging in 
to the edge of the lubricant trough and stirred up a few molecules of lubricant and, and smeared it on the head and, and that led their condition that it caused it to crash. And, and you could re reproduce this thing with software in, in maybe five, six hours. I mean, we had to, you know, give it a sequence of events like idle the system and then you would read, you know, cylinder three or something instead of zero. And then by God, you looked down there was a silver streak starting, you know. And, uh, so, so the fix for it was you wrote some program called Eccentric Kick. The, the, all it did is just opened up, you know, dev RH, P, whatever, and then every 15 seconds it, it would seek to, you know, 500 cylinders farther on down. So if there's no I.O., it would move ahead like 500 cylinders of a shot. And so it would never overheat, you know, during idle times of the night. And then all the drive manufacturers put that into their firmware and drives to keep moving ahead slowly if they don't overheat. And it's, back in that time, CDC was, you know, was a predecessor to, I guess it was magnetic peripherals or whatever, which became Seagate. MPI. They, they held a, did you go to that too? They had a, a seminar up in, in Minneapolis for uh, Unix and, and, and disk drive hardware. And, and I can't remember if you went too, but. Uh, I went up there for some other disk event, I know. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote a paper on disk crash management back in the 80s. And we could predict, like, on, on the Google years when when the drives are going to crash, you know, the CDC drives. And, and uh, so we would shut down certain drives and, and then so we wouldn't crash and bring the last two or three weeks of the semester and bring it back online so we could crash and bring the summer because it was a less impact on us. And, you, you know, we crashed, you know, 20, 30 drives, you know, over three or four years just on the PI machine. And, and it, it turned out that uh, what was, and I wrote this up, this paper on managing disk crashes, and, and the CDC just kidnapped me the minute I walked in the plant. I mean, you know, you're coming here and they grabbed my report and took it to the copy room so they could get copies for all the engineers and, and listen. And, and so we did a study where we did a real time 24 hour period where we time stamped in the driver every single seek and read write, you know, in, you know, microsecond accuracy. And save this in a file. I mean, it was 300 megabytes of data at the time. You know, we had to write it to tape. But the CDC was able to look at that data and find a resonance condition in the positioners. At the time, the Berkeley software made use of rotational latency to tell, you know, that, and they had the file system so they would allocate sectors. So, you know, they would like write every third sector and, and stuff. So, you know, to make maximum use of transfer, and it knew the next sector where it was and it would start to seek to it and the head would wobble a little bit as it would get there and stop and so it would go out and read one sector and the head would go like that and then pull it back before the head quit wobbling and then when it pulled it back it, the wobble added and it, and it dipped enough where it could dip into the lubricant and, and set a crash condition up and uh, so we found that problem running you know 150 users on the EI machine flat out just by and, and the Berkeley software could optimize disk access well enough to reduce this hardware cost crash. So yeah, we had some other interesting disk failures with uh, we used to have the uh, motors rewound on the 97 or the nine yeah 9766s big monster couple horse motor rather than spend five hundred dollars for replacement take it down to the motor shop here and they do it up for 150 or so. Well they Brought one back one time and stuck it in and and we couldn't get the drive to work. It would load the heads and then they'd retract them immediately. And one of my engineers said, you know, what's wrong with this silly thing? He's been fighting it for a couple days. And, well, I'd made this, this special purpose disc controller that was for diagnostics. Um, would let you get in and mess with the code in the controller to do different things and had a uh, bus that came out so you could look at the, uh, the serial bit stream and the sync bytes and all that stuff. So I got on there with a the thing and noticed that, um, gee, the sync byte at the index pulse looks wrong. In fact, it's backwards. They had rewound the motor down at the motor shop, reversed the windings, and the motor was running backwards. <laughs> so the head still flew. Well, they were, they were round heads on those things anyway, so there wasn't much difference. But of course, it wasn't there very long because it would come out and do its first seek and try to find the sync bite and 
not find it and retract immediately. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a thought. Hmm. Well, I guess it's probably time to. Anybody got questions or? More yeah, we could never figure. It. The Vax 780 came out, and uh, the obvious next step would have been a faster machine. Instead, they came out with slower machines. Uh, the 750. 750 and, was, uh, they said it was 60% of the performance of a 780 and 40% of the price, and Bill Joy said it's 40% of the performance for 60% of the price. <laughs> there, Joe has some pictures over here if you want to see some brochures of 780 and 750. But they always seem to do the real, just like Hummers, you know, they do the real one first, the Hummer 1, and then they start making smaller, weeny ones, and they're up to the H3 or H4 now. It's just like a motorized wheelchair, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they just sort of, I think that was the start of Dex's demise. Uh, the 782 was about 1.5 times the 780 for two and a quarter times the price. Our seven, our dual 780 was, you know, 1.8 times the performance for 20 percent more price. Yeah. So, you know, you go figure. They didn't make enough money on that, yes. And the bus wasn't fast enough to put a third processor on. Um, but they had things like the Jupiter and stuff, and they canceled the Jupiter. I remember whatever that was. You know, they had some big massive machine, and they never, they never could get it to run. And then, then when Google came along, you know, with ECL logic and, you know, like, like 10x the speed, you know, we're talking 10 MIPS now instead of 1. And, uh, and that kind of blew away the 780s at that point with this ECL logic running at, you know, minus 2.2 volts at literally thousands of amps on the bus. And the bus bars were, were copper, you know, I mean, you know, one inch square with silver plating on there's something like you know, 10, 15, 300 amp supplies in parallel and things. And, but then after that, there's something called the Pentium showed up, you know, the Pentium 60, and that blew away the, the Gould, so that kind of ended the whole thing. So and here we are today. We have micro watch processors running, you know, hundreds of you know, blobs and stuff. Now the processors like cost nothing to CIO. Latency seems to be a big problem. 